Do you ever get uh, nervous before you show a final piece? Never was nervous, unless it was a really, really fussy client who wanted her eyebrows done a certain way. Or I mean, every, every person has a different, um, you know, set of criteria they're going to bring to looking at a, at a piece of art. What's been really interesting, and contrary to what some people might think, is I mean, you don't associate, you know, soldiers, commanders with people who spend a lot of time in art galleries. But it's their, you know, supreme facility for looking at complexity. And I found they get really excited and can become extremely articulate when they're looking at a, at a piece of art. Then those pictures were, yeah, they're, they're like more, you see, those were in, those were taken in around 72 or 73, so when I was about 22 or 23 years old. I started um, to focus on, on art as a way of life, as a profession in my mid-20s. I'd grown up with my father, Frederick Steiger's uh, work around me continuously. And I'd say that, um, you know, uh, over, you know, a couple of decades hon honing aesthetic skills, um, sort of analytical skills when it came to the visual was unbeknownst to me until my mid twenties, really a direction I was going to go in. I'd always had, even since a teenager, when, you know, my friends, for example, a couple of them had started Now Magazine. They were ultra left wing and totally anti-police and military. Um, would say to me, oh, Trudy, you, you must be sick. We'd be, for example, a situation outside of, of Rochdale where uh, some, some police might be interacting with uh, a couple of students and, uh, and a friend, my, my friend Susanna said, oh, those people pigs, you know, look what they're doing. And I, I'd come back with something to the effect, well, think of the responsibilities the police have, you know, would you like to live in a city without the police? So by extension, it sounds very inane, but um, that sort of simplistic um, attitude I had, which extended to, do you want to live in a city without police? Do you want to live in a country without armed forces? Surfaced during the Gulf crisis, where I said to myself, what direction am I going to do with art? Continue with large abstract work or tackle subject matter, which I would really like to know more about and incorporate it into my work. So the Gulf crisis series, which I did in 1991, had, I had a large show at King and Bathurst, was really my first uh, war work even though it wasn't um, dealing with individuals, it was um, using huge handsaws or presenting handsaws in a very big way, metaphorically. After that, the work was all research-based, focused on individuals in the Canadian Forces. In my two-year Delaire Rwanda series, um, it hadn't occurred to me, but a, an arts critic was at the, at the show at Propeller Gallery and said, this is protest art. And actually, I, I, was, I didn't do it from, from that perspective, but some Rwandan victims of the genocide came to my show. And uh, it was uh, quite, uh, quite remarkable. Um, one of them uh, commented that he found the work so um, like a tribute to the genocide. He said, the fact that you haven't made it all bloody. He said, you've made it so dignified. That was the word he used. And the, the touches of red, for example, in, um, with one of the victims, just you know, her legs are open. She's you know, got no undergarments. There's some red indicating rape, but not actually explicitly, visually describing the rape process. And another Rwandan victim uh, who had lost an arm 
I asked him about, you know, this pressure. What, what is this pressure you must feel to always talk about your, um, your war, your experience in the genocide? I think we'd been talking about General Dallaire and all the speaking engagements he was doing. Um, and this, this young man said, I don't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it, and I never will talk about it. And I could appreciate that. Not everyone has spent a lot of time looking at art. And when this is war art, and as I've said in my responses to some people, I mean, the onus is on me, I feel, to make it powerful. So in, in those cases, um, I emailed the people that, the soldiers who were upset, and I explained, you know, my role as a war artist and how this piece, which I, I uh, the text of which I, I use being saved in huge, a huge, in huge font colon for what question mark. I explained the rationale behind how I, I was presenting the triple amputee, the bandaged triple amputee just post-surgery. And, and said that it was really an homage. At the same time, it was defense commentary because the for what could, you know, be about, you know, you know was, was his life worth living? Was the mission worth? Or it could be what's around the corner geopolitically in Afghanistan. He, the triple amputee is basically a metaphor for Afghanistan. And the uh, for what is referencing the famous World War I painting of Fred Varley, which took me two years to come to terms with. I wanted to use the for what. And finally, when it dawned on me that saved colon for what within which to situate a wounded individual, a veteran, um, not knowing at that point it would be a triple amputee, but searching for the right image to put with save for what resulted in that piece. So a huge amount of consideration going into it. The opposition, um, I try to deal with it. And there was even a, when I did a talk at Fort York, when the Art of Command was first shown there, there, was a, there were threats coming through that some of these veterans were going to, um, what's the word, um, disrupt, the, disrupt my presentation. They never did, um, unfortunately. I was actually almost looking forward to to meeting them, but for whatever reason, they they didn't they didn't come. In considering this line between war and military art, which has always driven my approach um, with the military portraits, is a desire to um, you know show the humanism of these commanders and the. Um, Sort of the psychological makeup, for example, by using the patterning that's in there in the camouflage. And similarly with General Petraeus in his head with the, the gray, uh, at the time, American um, pixelated pattern. The piece of uh, Colonel Stogren, who had been ombudsman a um, uh, number of years ago and was, was basically fired, is the subject in Art of War, huge text, and underneath the word unfuck, and flanked by other texts out of the word unfuck, pardon my French, is um, your head and then the system. Um, his being an acknowledged PTSD sufferer. As with many, sometimes I'd really push for the, the text I wanted to use. And in this case, at the last sitting, I said, you know, I really, really want to use this word with art of war. And he said, oh, my God, you know, I, my wife Trish will shit her pants if you do that. <laughs> anyway, I really pushed for it. He understood why I wanted to do it. And he ended up buying one of the prints, and his wife loves it. So it's coming to terms with it. I mean, if you're the wife of a soldier, you know the horrors they go through, you know the, um, you know, from, from her perspective, I mean, living with 
a soldier with a commander for, for decades. And it, it meant a huge amount to me that she came to terms with the peace and could appreciate it. Doing this work is sometimes, uh, I've reached points along the way where, where I think, I really don't know if I have anything left to give. Maybe it's, you know, not, uh, you know, maybe there isn't really that much validity to anything I've done. And then you, you know, you feel that you actually really have, have accomplished something. Now, um, I'd really like to develop um, uh, a larger American group, a smaller group of generals, but uh, hopefully the, the Treyas work might, you know, might lead to another couple of individuals. But if it only stays with, with him being the only American, I can't imagine, you know, having a more significant um, general if, um, as a subject than himself. Doing Janice Stein was extremely satisfying. Putting the portrait of her beside the head study of Petraeus and, and considering, you know, her, her, uh, um, her expertise and, you know, for example, the book she wrote, um, The Unexpected War, which I recently read, pairing her with and her, you know, representing her, um, her position on the war in Afghanistan, which, as she acknowledged, would be quite different from the position that General Petraeus would have, creates an, an interesting dynamic. The Petraeus piece is really about logic, vision, and command. And all of the logic in the world isn't going to uh, necessarily give you the right conclusions. Of this tremendous responsibility that you have, and when people die, your own soldiers that you command, that civilians die, there's an anguish about that, that the really um, thoughtful and reflective military have, and I think that's that you've got that Gertrude very, very much in the portrait. Oh, that's satisfying. Well, the fact the platforms you know within which you analyze the success of a mission are are varied, and you could say it can be too soon to evaluate. Um, so interesting to consider from two perspectives like that what all this is about and how successful or not my work is. So this is a self-portrait my, my father did. Um, my mother was a nurse, Ruby Steiger. And my dad with the, one of his works. And my sister Linda with a self-portrait she did, which is, she was thinking of the Frida Kahlo portraits. And this is um, my father's sister Gertrude, who I was named after. And she was one of the one of the people who perished during the Holocaust. So this is my father in First World War, um, in uniform. He came to Canada after the First World War, and he was <clears throat> a good tw <clears throat> 20 years old, uh, older than my mother. First, you know, records seem to indicate that he was Romanian, though so he always said he was Austrian. <laughs> <laughs>